Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Member Engagement Librarian at South Central Regional Library Council. Today's program is the second in a series that we're calling Moon Mondays, Get Ready for the 2024 Total Solar Eclipse. This series is supported in part by the American Astronomical Society's J.M. Pasikoff Solar Eclipse Mini Grants Program. Today we're here to learn about the work of regional observatories and science organizations. And first up, we have Drew Desker, Director of the Copernic Observatory and Science Center. So thanks for joining us, Drew. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for uh, including me in this uh, in this event. Really looking forward to it. Uh, uh, again, uh, my name is Drew Desker. I am the Executive Director of the Copernic Observatory and Science Center. Uh, that's my email address, and I can put that in the chat uh, afterwards uh, um, if you wish to communicate directly with me. So just a, a little bit of background. Um, the Copernic Observatory is named after Nikolai Copernic, who we also know as Nicholas Copernicus. And usually when I do tours, I ask, does anybody know what Copernicus is famous for? And very often it's just crickets is all you hear. <laughs> but uh, so what Copernic did was uh, he was a Polish astronomer. He was born in 1473 and uh, he was quite the academic, but um uh, his contribution to astronomy uh, uh, was he developed what's called the, the heliocentric model of the solar system. Up until Copernic's time, people thought that the, that the, all the planets and the sun revolved around the Earth, but sometimes those planets looked like they would be moving backwards. We call that retrograde motion. And so he did the math and said, no, if, it's, if we put the sun in the center, then it all makes sense. So in 1973... Uh, Copernic Observatory would have been, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Copernic, the astronomer, would have been 500 years old. And uh, people of uh, Polish immigrants and people of Polish heritage here in the southern tier uh, wanted to do more than just plunk a statue in the park and say, we're done. So they built the original observatory. And um, this is actually a, a, the cornerstone that is part of our building. Um, the man on the left is Dr. Ed Kozlowski. The man on the far, far right is Richard Miller. Um, they were uh, uh, the you know people that uh, were part of that Copernic Society. Uh, the gentleman in the in the dark suit. Um, some of us, if you look at the face uh, closely, uh, you'll recognize that as uh, Commander Jim Lovell. So in 1973, uh, this was two years after the Apollo 13 mission. Um, uh, Commander Lovell was uh, up in the, the Minton area and uh, sort of helped us uh, get the cornerstone uh, set on the building. So in the early 70s, that's what it looked like. Uh, it was just a single, uh, let's see if you can see my mouse here, uh, two, uh, a single classroom and, and we had two domes. It was then donated to the Robeson Museum and Science Center uh, down in downtown Binghamton. They ran it for about 33, 34 years, uh, during which they did a, a major capital campaign and expanded it to where it looks like today, um, adding about... Uh, four or five times the floor space in the main building, adding an additional uh, third uh, third dome and telescope. Uh, but in 2007, uh, Copernic came back to the uh, uh, Copernic Society of, of Broome County. Uh, uh, Roberson decided they were, uh, it was too expensive for them to run. And so the Copernic Society said that they would, um, uh, that they would take it back. And so Copernic's, our mission statement is really, uh, that we want to be an innovative leader in interdisciplinary lifelong learning in science, technology, engineering, and math. And so uh, we typically, uh, between uh, who, people who come to Copernic, as well as uh, people who go to, uh, when we go out to uh, um, schools and libraries and other uh, other organizations, we will engage up uh, upwards of 10,000 people, um, uh, you know, at a, you know, over a year's period of time. And so these are our three main domes that we've got. Uh, inside each of the domes, uh, we have uh, the telescopes. This is an astrophysics uh, uh, six-inch refracting telescope. We use this predominantly to look at planets. We'll look at the moon. And if we put a solar filter on, we can look at the sun. We also have a 14-inch Celestron Edge HD, and we use this primarily more for deep sky objects. Um, uh, the bigger the... Uh, the aperture, the more light that it collects. And uh, oops, and then finally, um, our uh, our largest scope is a 20 inch reflecting telescope uh, made by Optical Guidance Systems. And we use this exclusively for imaging. 
Uh, this scope is really designed uh, to take uh, images. And so uh, down, uh, you know, down below here where the light would otherwise come out, uh, we have a, a very highly sensitive uh, CCD camera. And this is the kind of picture that we can take. Um, back in May of this past year, uh, this is a galaxy called Messier 101. And this little bright spot here uh, that's pointed out is a supernova that was uh, discovered. And this is a, a picture we took on a Friday night, actually when we were open to the public. And um, if you were to have looked at this uh, <clears throat> uh, galaxy, uh, you know, two or three weeks prior, uh, that bright light would not have been there. So this is a supernova that happened in this case, me <laughs> millions of years ago, but just starting to show up at our place right now. But again, we, uh, being a public observatory, we uh, do uh, a number of uh, events. And this was actually the solar eclipse that we uh, hosted uh, back in 2017. We had about 1,500 people that showed up on that day. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, beyond our three scopes we have in domes, we have a, um, a scope we call the heliostat, which goes through, um, it's actually in one of our classrooms and can actually project uh, the sun against uh, the wall. And the um, uh, uh, so actually from, from this point right here to this point here is actually nine feet across. And when we have uh, school groups come in, I take a quarter and I walk up to the sun and said, this is how big the earth is compared to this nine, the, this nine feet across. And let's see here. Let's try that. Okay, here we go. Um, other ways we can look uh, at the sun is we would um, aim a telescope, you know, at the sun and then project it on a sheet of paper. And if you look in this upper right hand, uh, well, actually near the top here, you'll see a really perfectly round dot. That is actually the planet Venus. This was during what's called the Venus, Venus transit. That was back in 2000, I think, 11 or 12. Uh, Dennis, I don't know if you'll correct me on that. Um, but another way that we look at it and... Um, one that we actually uh, do very often now is we call it a, a sun funnel. Uh, this is actually uh, a automotive funnel that uh, we then chop off a bit of the, the end of it. We hose clamp the funnel onto the eyepiece of the telescope. And then this white material here is basically a dollar store shower curtain. And we're doing rear projection. And this was an annular eclipse that happened back in 2021. And I took this um, right down the... Uh, the street from my from my home, and you can actually see where the moon was taking a nice bite out of the uh, out of the sun. Uh, I mentioned earlier that our six inch uh, telescope has a uh, uh, it's called a Herschel wedge, uh, but it allows us to um, uh, hold on here. There we go um, to look at the sun safely um, with, through our big six inch uh, refracting telescope. And again, this little dark spot here is a, is a sunspot. And if you look right up in this area, you'll see a really perfectly round dot. And on the next slide, there's a much closer look at that round dot. And that's actually the planet Mercury. This was during the Mercury transit back in 2015, 2016 that we took, took up here. So of course, now we're talking about eclipses. And uh, so whenever we go out to schools uh, or libraries, uh, you know, we talk about you know, what is an eclipse. And, you know, so in this case, uh, a lunar eclipse is where the Earth uh, comes between uh, the sun and the moon. And what's coming up in April is the solar eclipse, where the moon is going to come between the um, uh, the Earth and the sun. Uh, the moon is coming between, uh, between the Earth and the sun. And, of course, uh, finally, uh, we have the apocalypse. And, uh, <laughs> which... Um, it's sort of self uh, self describing. So uh, uh, this will not happen, <laughs> or it better not happen. Let's put it that way. Anyway, um, again, be, being a public observatory, we are from March to mid December. We are open on every Friday night, and um, uh, so actually in March we will have a series of nighttime uh, Friday night programs called March to the Eclipse, and some some of those nights we'll uh, talk about. We'll have some family activities around that, but uh, talking about you know mechanics behind eclipses and how do you how do you look at them safely we have ordered uh, a set of uh glasses you know, uh, eclipse glasses that are specifically uh, uh branded for copernic observatory and talking about you know when to 
you know, when uh, you have needed the classes on and when if you're in fortunate to be in totality, you know, you uh, once you're in totality, then you can take the glasses off. Now, one of the things we also do is when we when we go uh, to uh, talk about you know, how do you look at the sun safely? Uh, what you're seeing right here is actually um, what not to do. Uh, this uh, person actually, uh, this is a, a sample of uh, what happens when you take a pair of, you put this, uh, the, the solar eclipse glasses on, and then you take a pair of binoculars and you look up at the sun. And that took about a second to burn through that film. So clearly you never, ever, ever want to um, use these, uh, these glasses with anything other than just the naked eye. Do not use anything else beyond that. Again, uh, so... In preparation for this eclipse, we are offering uh, uh, library programs. We have a portable planetarium that we can bring uh, to your to your site. We have two different size domes, one that's about uh, nine feet in, in height, another one that's in 12 feet in height. Uh, the, the, one, the one that's 12 foot uh, in, you know, in height can hold maybe 20 to 25 people. The smaller one can hold maybe up to 15 to 18 people, uh, along with some you know, hands-on activities. Uh, we're also going out to schools, uh, providing assemblies uh, to, uh, to you know to large large groups of schools. We can bring our planetarium there as as well as hands on um, activities. So um, I've got myself at about I think 10, 11 minutes. I don't know if there's any other questions uh, that people uh, wanted to offer, or if you wanted to uh, uh, hold those off until the end. Um, but I want to make sure that we get all of our other speakers. Uh, uh, the, their time uh, on the great American stage here. Sure, that sounds great. So um, I'm seeing one question in the chat. Drew, are people able to bring their own telescopes to the observatory during public viewing nights? Oh, okay, sure. Yes, absolutely. We actually, uh, we promote that uh, uh, very often. And uh, in fact, actually, uh, usually right around the 4th of July weekend, uh, either side of that, we have what we call the great American, uh, the great telescope dust off. Because we know that people have got telescopes in their, you know, basements, their attics, their garages that are just sitting there. Some people, you know, that would just say, bring all the parts you have. And we sort of help them uh, put it together. Find Sometimes you find they they put the sighting scope on backwards, which doesn't help them. Uh, or they're missing eyepieces. And so, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you uh, come up on a Friday night, please feel free to uh, to bring your uh, bring your telescope up. And uh, see any other questions. Are you going to continue with your Friday night YouTube talks? Oh, yes. That was another thing what we did was, um, again, with our Friday night programs, uh, back in 2020, we had to stop our um, bringing people up to the Copernic Observatory because of COVID. We said, okay, well, fine. We'll just wait a couple of weeks for this COVID thing to blow over. And obviously that didn't quite play out that way. And uh, so we started live streaming where we had the speakers uh, zoom into our facility here. And then we turned it back on uh, out onto our YouTube channel, which uh, now we have over 25,000 subscribers. And uh, so, yes, we continue to do all of our Friday night programs um, on, on YouTube. Actually, this coming Saturday is our big uh, winter star party uh, celebrating uh, Copernic's birthday. And uh, and so, you know, those those presentations will be on that as well. And as far as the best way to connect uh, to my uh, uh, connect with you or school programs, here, gonna, I'll put my uh, my email address in the chat. Uh, See if I spell it right. Yep, there you go. All right, so there's my email address, and um, uh, you know, we're, again, we're getting a lot of interest. Uh, so uh, if if um, if this is something that you'd like to do, uh, please uh, please reach out to us. But even beyond that, uh, within the libraries, we've done a number of uh, programs throughout the uh, the the summer reading programs. I believe uh, one of the sort of the national reading is like the adventure starts here. I believe is is a summer reading theme. So, uh, so we are developing uh, programs that we can bring again, uh, bring our planetarium out, um, and um, and let people uh, you know explore that as well. Nice, thank you. We also had a question in advance, so I'll pose oh, yeah. it to you. Um, somebody was asking, do solar eclipse glasses expire? So clearly, you wouldn't want to reuse the ones with the holes in it. Yeah. But... <laughs> right. So the, the 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 film itself really doesn't expire so long as you take care of it. Uh, if there's any kind of scratch or pinhole, you absolutely want to throw that away. Uh, any crease to it. Uh, so if you do buy uh, or or you know do get a set of of eclipse glasses, 
I would find a, you know, find a nice envelope, even wrap it in, in tissue paper uh, inside that and keep it, um, keep it protected. So, yeah. All right. Good to know. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Now stop sharing. So next up, we have Dennis O'Connell, who is one of the founding members of the Elmira Corning Astronomical Society. If you want to bring up your screen share. Let's see. I guess we'll do it this way. Okay. Uh, can you see it there? There we go. Yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, my name is Dennis O'Connell, and uh, I was uh, uh, an adjunct instructor at Corning Community College. Oops. Where did it come from? Oh, no, no, not now. Okay. But anyway, uh, Corning Community College was founded back in 1958. Okay, and then the, the classes were held down in the city of Corning in different buildings. But then in uh, 64, I believe it was, they moved up the college or the campus up on Spencer Hill. Okay, and then in uh, 94, the uh, the college got a grant to build an observatory and planetarium. Okay, and you can see it up there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the planetarium is a big dome up front, and the uh, the, the observatory is uh, the small dome on the back. And that's the Eileen Collins Observatory. And I don't know if I can get to this point right here. Uh <laughs> Okay, anyways, you're coming up the hill. Uh, this is the way you would see it. You come up onto the campus, come around the, the circle, and you go about 100 yards, come to this curve, and you're looking right up the hill at the, the planetary and the observatory. Uh, the observatory, actually, Corning Community College is kind of interesting in it. We are one of very few facilities that has both a planetarium and an observatory. Okay, And the observatory was built in uh, 64. Oh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in 67, 1967, uh, when the, the Elmira Corning Astronomical Society formed, uh, there were three of us, uh, Polly Johnson, Walter Lawrence, and myself got together, and we advertised, and we did a couple star parties, got a few more people interested, and one big star party up at uh, Harris Hill, uh, we picked up a number of very, very talented people, okay? We approached Corner Community College and volunteered to build an observatory for the college if they would provide the land. And they did that. Uh, but it was up by the water towers, up the other side of Spencer Hill Road. At any rate, we raised funds and we got donations from local construction companies uh, to build the original observatory. And it was a roll-off roof thing. Uh, uh, we got a, a telescope, a used telescope from uh, Alfred University. Okay, uh, they were getting rid of it, uh, upgrading to another uh, telescope. So we found out about it, and we bought the telescope from them. It was a 16-inch uh, reflector, Newtonian reflector. At any rate, we worked. Uh, we operated up there for a number of years, uh, open public star parties every Friday night. And we finally had to cut it back to the first and third Friday nights because of uh, you know conflicts with people and their, their, their activities. At any rate... Uh, in 19, uh, yeah, 94, okay, the new observatory was built and then the planetarium. So we moved all the facilities down. As a matter of fact, we moved the whole observatory, the 16 inch observatory down there, the roll off roof. So there's actually two observatories. There's one up behind the, the, the dome there. At any rate, our primary instrument is a one tenth model of the 200 inch telescope at Mount Palomar. Okay. This is a very, very, historic telescope okay this was the first of uh, the telescope was built to make sure certain uh, operations for the the 200 would work number one being the hydraulic horseshoe mount okay uh the way this thing works is well typically you know uh, a, a telescope would rotate on uh, roller bearings well the 200 inch was going to be so heavy so massive that it would crush any existing roller bearings so uh the fellow named Bailey, who designed was called the Horseshoe Mount. Okay. Now, still had a problem in that uh, we, we have to be able to move this thing. Well, then another one, Russell Porter, a, an amateur astronomer, redesigned the thing. He took roller bearings out of the thing completely. And he designed it to work under pressure from oil. We pump oil under real high pressure 
under there's four pads, one on either side of the base there. And it actually raises the telescope up about, a, oh gosh, thickness of the hair on your head. The whole telescope rotates on a very, very thin film of oil. Okay, This is the very first hydraulic horseshoe mount ever built. So it's a very, very historic thing. The other thing too about this telescope to make sure it would work is the Surrey truss tube. Okay, Telescope has to balance itself on both ends. Okay. And this telescope, the 200 newtons, is going to be so massive that if it was a solid tube, both ends would bend. Well, the problem being, you have a primary mirror down the bottom, that red area there, okay? Uh, that's a, an iris that covers the mirror to protect it. Primary mirror, the light comes down, hits the primary, and is refocused back up to a secondary mirror up at the top, which refocuses it back down to a hole in the primary mirror where you do your focusing. Well, if those two mirrors are out of line by even a little bit, you get a fuzzy image and you'd have 200 tons of junk. So Surrey designed a tube, okay, that would bend. Both ends would bend, but they bend exactly the same amount in exactly the same direction. So those mirrors always stay lined up. This is the very first Surrey truss tube ever built. Okay? So it's a very historic telescope. And we're very, very proud to have it. We got it from the Corning Museum of Glass. The Corning Museum of Glass got it from Caltech. Uh, when Corning was doing a remodel, I think that was back in, oh my gosh, I think that was back in about the 60s too. They uh, they wanted this telescope to be uh, to placed in the museum, okay, because Corning made the 200 inch mirror, you know, for the, the, the Hale telescope. But anyway, uh, they ran out of room and they donated to Corning Community College. Well, Don Hagen was the president at the time. And he got a grant through the state to build an observatory and a planetarium facilities. Okay. So anyway, we got this thing in there and we hired one of our own. The telescope had been sitting in a, a, a warehouse over on the north side of Corning for like eight years, just gathering dust and rusting and all that. So we hired one of our astronomy members, Lynn Murray, and he tore this telescope completely apart, right down to nuts, bolts, screws, uh, sandblasted. Uh, reprimed, repainted the whole thing, and we got the thing reassembled. And we fired the thing up, and we ran into a Hubble problem. Apparently, the mirrors had never been ground and polished to be used. It was supposed to be just for Caltech students to learn how to use the 200-inch telescope. Caltech owns the 200. At any rate, then we had to have the telescope. We had the thing torn apart, sent out to a company in Colorado, DFM. And they repolished or refigured, repolished the mirrors, uh, upgraded the computer program or the pro computer system, and upgraded the, the hydraulic system. So now it's a research grade instrument. It's a beautiful scope. Doesn't get used much, but uh, you know, it's there for anybody, you know, any of our students who want to use it. And it has been used a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of our uh, adjunct instructors, Tony Cece, has discovered uh, 20 asteroids with this thing and he's actually named one corning so there's actually a, a, an asteroid up there named corning at any rate this is one of the things we do for tours okay now i think yeah i don't want to go any further with this uh anyway uh we at the college okay we have our uh, you know our public uh, observing sessions too remember the first and third friday of every month from september through uh to june we don't meet uh in july or august because it just gets too dark too late uh you know most of the kids we or most of the people we have up here are, you know young families of kids and it's just too late for them to stay up so we just don't do it during the summertime at any rate we also have in particular one night of the year a kids night and the kids uh come up here and we have programs for them uh, public observing, if that's you know the skies are clear, we have the telescopes out and they can look through the telescopes. Uh, they do planetarium shows. Uh, we also they they make little projects. Okay, they can make their own planetsphere, uh, a little astronomical type of bracelet, uh, a little CD uh, spectroscope. Okay, all sorts of little things like that the kids can even do. And we get to, oh my gosh, we've had 150 to 200 kids up there one night. It's pretty crowded. But at any rate, we also, uh, we do uh, the first and third Fridays 
uh, as public observing. If it's clear, if not, then we do tours. And we also have a, a show, uh, what we call 2030 Pictures Show, that the uh, that the students have taken uh, with this telescope. Oh, excuse me. Anyway, also, you know, like Copernic, we do special events, uh, lunar eclipses, solar eclipses. Uh, we were up there. We had to, for the uh, the both the Mercury and the Venus transits. Uh, had a big night with the. Um, uh, the Leonid super uh, shower uh, uh, back in, I think that was when, 96. But uh, we also do outreach programs. Uh, we go to different schools. Uh, we put on, uh, you know, demonstrations, lectures. Uh, we've done lectures for uh, uh, fraternal organizations, uh, uh, you know, clubs, whatever. Uh, we've gone to the youth camps, too. And done things. I I used to go every year to a Cubs or a Boy Scout camp and do a, uh, a solar thing during the daytime, and of course nighttime observing at night. Teach me a merit badge. We've been to Girl Scout camps. Uh, oh, we've gone to uh, church groups. Uh, oh, we've done uh, uh, libraries. Whatever you know, if you if you want to show, uh, we're there to help out. Let me see. I'm going to kick back out of this thing for a second here. Now, part of the program here was to, to talk about uh, uh, the lunar eclipse or the solar eclipse. I'm sorry. And I just put on a, a talk uh, this past month at the uh, Elmira Corning Astronomical Society on safe solar photography. Okay. Now, this is something... You know, a lot of people are going to be tempted to do, and unless you've had some experience at it, I don't recommend anybody getting involved with it. It's just entirely too dangerous. Now, like Drew mentioned, you know, with the uh, the solar filters or the eyeglass things there, where somebody, you know, put the blackers up and burn a hole in the, uh, the, uh, the film, it's too much of a chance of doing something wrong. Solar astronomy... Is an extremely dangerous hobby. It's a zero tolerance for error hobby. You're not allowed any mistakes whatsoever. One mistake and you're blind. All right. Now, let me show you. Let's see here. Doo -doo -doo. Okay. You want to take some pictures. Okay. You got your telephoto set up. You got your, your digital camera. And you're going to need some sort of a filler. Now, again, just like what Drew was mentioning, no filters at the camera end. The filter has to be in front of the aperture. Otherwise, you're going to focus a humongous amount of heat, you know, under your film, and you're going to burn it up and incinerate the inside of your camera. Filter has to be on the outside. Now, this is a special adapter type of thing. Uh, I sent away and got a film, and I made an adapter for uh, the, uh, the filter adapter that I had, Okay. And you can send away, you get this film, uh, you know, I got it through uh, eBay, I think, okay? At any rate, basic setup, uh, your camera, telephoto lens. By the way, this is a 400 millimeter, and this is just about the right size. I would not recommend, you know, going an awful lot higher. Anywhere from maybe 300 to 500 millimeters is good. Okay. And you can send away... And you get these filters that'll fit any one of your cameras or you know the camera lenses. Again, these things go over the front, lock in place and top, and you're ready to go. Okay. This is a picture that I took uh, through that setup. Now, it's small. You know, you say, oh my gosh, you know, you can make a much bit for bigger. Well, you know, th the problem is you're gonna be very, very busy, you know, when you're taking your pictures. Okay, and the chances of making mistake are pretty great. Again, solar astronomy, solar photography is extremely dangerous. And you want to keep it simple, as simple as possible. And the way to do it is a small image like this. You start off. I mean, you can always blow the thing up, you know, digitally, you know, later on. But the thing is, if you've got this thing this size, when totality hits, you should just take the filter right directly off, and you're ready to get the wide field views of the corona. Okay, 
when the eclipse is over, it's just a quickie flip back and put the filter back, lock it in place, you know, and you're back to this and you can catch the, uh, the ending of the eclipse. Those are great now, images. I think I'm sorry? we're going to have to pause you there just because I want to leave a minute or two for questions for you. Oh, okay. Um, so given all that, where are you going to be for the eclipse, Denny? And are you going high tech or low tech? Well, we are not really sure if we're going to have anything going on up the observatory. Uh, most of us, because the eclipse path is so close, most of us, uh, you know, want to go up and see if we can catch it. Uh, like I say, I'm 79 years old. This is absolutely my last chance. So if it's clear, you know, I'm going to be probably going up to Buffalo or Rochester. Uh, I know Debbie Dan, the, the observatory director, is planning on going. Same thing. And then the, our uh, society uh, president, is he's going down to Texas. So if it looks like it's going to be cloudy, partially cloudy, such that I can't see, uh, you know, the, the corona, then I will probably stay at the observatory. And we can just do the thing with a, maybe a white light dealing of the uh, uh, the partial phases. But um, most likely, uh, well, there is also a possibility that uh, 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 Jennifer Sellers at the uh, the planetarium might be setting up uh, one of our solar telescopes. We have a couple of uh, telescopes. We can do either hydrogen alpha or white light. So she might be setting up, but I uh, know because she's planning on staying, you know, at the college. But uh, the observatory probably will not be open, you know, for the eclipse. And are you going to try to photograph it then? You shared a lot and of photographs. I don't know if she will be or not. Uh -huh. she, she would have to be trained. And again, like I say, solar astronomy is very, very dangerous unless you've had some experience at it. I highly recommend you don't even try it. Really, you know, if, if you have never done solar astronomy, okay, you want to take pictures of the eclipse, you know, turn on the NASA channel and, and, and watch the whole thing, you know, take the pictures off the screen. It's a heck of a lot safer. Yeah, point taken. I will not be trying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Denny. So next up, we have Dr. Joshua Thomas, Assistant Professor of Astronomy and the Director of Alfred University's Stell Observatory. Hi there. Hello. All right, I think it's sharing. Uh, yeah, so I'm the new, brand new director of Stell Observatory at Alfred University. This is my second semester at Alfred. Um, so I haven't really had a chance to plan anything for the eclipse, but I will just say, like the last presenter, I am planning to drive the short distance to totality. Um, we are very close. Um, uh, Alfred is like 99.98 or something percent of totality. Um, a short 30 minute drive will get me two minutes of totality. So that's what I'm planning to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, we probably will have like a live stream going and we've got eclipse glasses to hand out and such for um, uh, people that are staying, staying around here. But uh, yeah, so Stahl Observatory uh, is, uh, as you can see, got a lot of domes. Uh, there's actually one not pictured because it's down the hill from where this picture was taken. Uh, so in total, there are six domes. Um, and um, the other dome that wasn't pictured is down the hill is right there in this uh, picture here. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the history of uh, the observatory as I've learned it so far. Um, Alfred's uh, got a really long history, if you want to take it uh, that way. Uh, our oldest telescope, which is in this uh, dome, I don't know if the pointer is working, there it is, uh, is in this dome uh, that is housing our a uh, nine inch refractor. So slightly different angle here. Uh, there's the building with the nine inch refractor. This uh, is the Fitz telescope. This was uh, uh, the optics portion of it uh, at the front end of the telescope was uh, ground in the 1800s, it was purchased by Alfred in 1836, uh, around the time of the founding of the university. Um, it used to be in a different location. And at some point the building was torn down and then this was stored. And then when it was found in the sixties, 
uh, by John Stahl, who the observatory is named after, um, he found that the, the tube had deteriorated. It was wooden. Uh, so he made a new tube and he built a mount. I really wish I would have uh, met this guy. He sounds like quite the uh, quite the uh, jack of all trades. He made a bunch of money uh, designing the one-dimensional air tracks that are used in physics labs across the country and probably around the world. And he has a passion for astronomy. So he used that money to literally build this observatory. In many cases, uh, parts of telescopes, if not whole telescopes, and including buildings. This building down the hill here, I was told he literally was putting plywood up and doing all that himself. So um, the biggest telescope uh, is in the building down the hill. Uh, this was entirely built by John Stahl. He welded all of the steel that you see. These telescopes are very heavy. Um, so it's very hard for us to replace the mounts uh, with anything modern. Um, this is a, our largest, is 32 inch uh, diameter mirror. It's a Newtonian reflector. Uh, there's uh, four ports at the top. Um, this one is computerized uh, in the 90s. Uh, it's uh, currently under repair. Um, we have a, in the tall building in the middle of the picture, we've got a 16 inch DFM, um, which uh, is running on a Windows XP machine. And uh, this will be replaced soon. And we have a small, uh, Celestron here that's dedicated for solar observing. Um, so we have a H alpha filter that we put on here. Um, there's a couple little tip off buildings here that have mounts for telescopes. And in the dome in the foreground, we've got a 20 inch uh, Newtonian. This was again built entirely by John Stahl, mount and uh, optics uh, assembled uh, and the tube welded all by John. And our newest telescope at the moment is in this tall building here, uh, which is a 24 inch plane wave, uh, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, we also have a classroom building that's not shown there. Uh, we have a really tiny um, planetarium projector. I wouldn't go as so far to call it a planetarium, but <laughs> um, it is a dome like thing screen <laughs> with a projector. Um, we have uh, Friday night public observing um, through the historic Fitz refractor and the Metzger, which is the 20 inch telescope uh, on clear Fridays. Uh, the dates or the times of that rather are in flux right now. I'm trying out 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, we have two students that run everything on those nights and um, I'm working on a, a new web presence that will have an updated uh, list of times, et cetera, for people. Um, so here's uh, the fits uh, pointed kind of at the moon there. Uh, it can take eyepieces or a camera as is seen here. And actually the background picture was taken, I think with my cell phone actually through the eyepiece. And here are a couple fun examples. This is uh, one of our student monitors who runs the Friday night open houses. Uh, that's his cell phone. And he's just trying to get a picture of, I don't know what they're probably Jupiter. And on the right is a cell phone picture I took uh, through the eyepiece of the fits. I mean, it's just amazing what uh, the optics quality from 1800s uh, plus a, a digital camera. It's quite impressive. Uh, the picture on the left is our night sky when it's actually clear, um, which uh, seems to not be too often lately. Um, we can see the Milky Way quite nicely. Um, and uh, that's just with my cell phone uh, set to probably like 30 second exposure. And uh, here are some views through the fits. Uh, all well, the, the big image of Jupiter here uh, was taken, I think, with a like an actual digital camera. The other pictures were all taken with a cell phone through the eyepiece, um, all by the students uh, trying to have fun looking at things. And I will say these pictures do not do it justice. Um, it is, you can very nicely see the red spot with your eye. Um, you can see the Cassini division quite nicely with your eye. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy looking through this uh, telescope. Um, some more pictures of our fabulous night sky when it is actually clear. Uh, you can see here the uh, little fuzzy spot in the middle of the image there is the uh, M31 or the Andromeda galaxy. And the one on the right is the, uh, Milky Way, and depending on your screen resolution, you might pick out a little satellite going through there. Again, these are both uh, cell phone pictures from the parking lot. So um, 
when it's dark, it's uh, when it's clear it's and dark, it is it is quite nice. Uh, we have uh, for solar observing capabilities, uh, this is our um, uh, little Celestron C8. We've actually got on the end there, most of the cover, most of the front of the telescope is completely covered. And there's only a small little hole with a special filter. Uh, much like was mentioned, you don't want to be messing with uh, solar astronomy if you don't know what you're doing. So there's actually a uh, special, another special filter here called the H alpha filter. And then actually we're just looking at it on the computer, or sorry, the uh, camera. This is a digital SLR. Uh, and we're just looking at the either the screen there or through the uh, finder. Uh, the picture in the bottom uh, is a picture of the sun taken with that camera. Um, and you can see very nice uh, solar flares and prominences, um, and probably some sunspots. Uh, yeah, I think toward the bottom, there's a nice little sunspot. Uh, we also have in one of our other buildings, we have a heliostat, um, which projects uh, not quite the same size image as Copernic, um, th but this is still pretty darn big. Um, so this was uh, from last uh, September. Uh, we had uh, the art students had borrowed some, we have little tiny solar projectors uh, that the art students had used and uh, sort of as a intersection uh, between art and science, uh, we had them up on a nice sunny day and we did some solar observing. Um, uh, the, I didn't intend to put that picture in here. The, so this is one of our previous, uh, uh, our previous director was actually a solar physicist. So he knows all about taking good pictures of the sun and is something that I will not spend time doing because that is a lot of work and dangerous as was mentioned. Um, but the picture on the right is one that some students took uh, in the past. Uh, here are some more things as seen from Alfred in various states. Um, all pretty pictures of various kinds. And um, more on the way. Um, I haven't had too many clear nights since I moved here and I've been uh, updating a lot of uh, software and things like that. So uh, stay tuned for more exciting things from Alfred. Uh, we do have some change on the way. So I alluded to our 16-inch uh, telescope uh, were uh, uh, being upgraded. So this is a plane wave mount uh, and we are going to be upgrading our 16-inch to a 20-inch. Um, so we will have three fingers crossed, uh, uh, robotically controlled telescopes uh, that will have apertures from 20 inch up to 32 inch. Um, and those will get used for uh, summer student projects for our summer astronomy uh, camp, uh, high school institute. So we'll be running that in uh, July. Um, then we have um, uh, also during the school student research projects, as well as my own research projects. And we have another new astronomer here, uh, Connor Robinson, who also is a stellar astronomer. So we will be studying uh, all sorts of cool things there. And uh, one of my uh, biggest excitements is uh, I'm getting to set up a spectrograph. So we got a uh, Shellyak uh, E-shell um, spectrograph, which lets us get the entire uh, optical uh, wavelength range um, in one little picture and there's software that turns this all into the boring squiggly lines that I like to study. Um, but, uh, that's what we have up and coming here at Alfred. So I'm uh, excited to do all that. And then I'll just skip to, uh, the, I opened the wrong presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, our public nights, while I say, <laughs> I'll try to get this up real quick. Our public nights are uh, Fridays uh, right now, seven to nine. I'm working on an updated web presence that will, um, there it is. Okay. Yeah. My brain suddenly seized up. All right. I don't know if I'm still sharing screen. Am I still sharing screen? Yep. Perfect. All right, so uh, our public observing, as I said, is Friday nights. Um, yeah, and uh, this uh, phone number here on the screen has an automated message that will let you know if we actually are open for the night. Um, as you know, weather can change rather rapidly. Um, so uh, right now, seven to nine. And uh, further contact information, uh, we now have an observatory at Alfred email. Um, you can also email me directly. Um, and our web presence right now is uh, listed here. 
Um, there's not a lot of information there. It does say generally when our um, open houses are, but I was uh, just put in contact with the right people to get me uh, an actual more informative web page set up. So that's up and coming. Uh, we are on Facebook and Instagram. I also created a YouTube page, which I had nothing is on yet, and nothing is on the Instagram yet. So, uh, you've been busy it. with the cloudy skies, then. <laughs> uh, yeah, trying to make advantage, take advantage of uh, the cloudy skies to get some of this done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, from the previous presentation, uh, someone was asking, "Is that an M13 globular cluster?" I'm not sure if you know which slide oh uh i did i put that back in here uh yeah this is m13 here yeah okay and that's then... uh yeah that's in hercules's armpit so <laughs> and then you got the pillars of creation on the right hand side which yes. is a great yeah. shot yeah yeah and i unfortunately don't know who took these these are from our archive so <laughs> And then do you do outreach to the area schools or libraries? Um, I mean, I, yes, look forward that in, to that in the future. Um, if anyone wants to come up, you know, the observatory is open, not just to, to students, but to the, to the general community. And, um, you know, nothing specific is set up uh, at the moment between schools, uh, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open to actually I did have one school reach out to me. I just uh, haven't heard back from them. Um, so, yes. We do that. Great, thank you. Yeah. So uh, last but not least, we have Allie Jackson. She's the Director of Programs and Partnerships at Ithaca Science Center. Hey, Allie. Hey, perfect, okay. Um, thank you, Jessica. So I'll go ahead and share um, a few slides. I don't have pretty pictures um, because we're, we're a museum, but we're not an observatory. Um, so, so thank you so much um, for including me in this roundup. Um, like so many other sort of STEM enthusiasts, we're getting really excited for April 8th. Um, the Science Center is a children's hands-on science museum um, up in Ithaca. We see over 100,000 museum visitors a year. And then we also see over about 60,000 um, participants in some of our offsite programming that we do in partnership with other community-based organizations, schools, and certainly libraries. Um, so my email is there. Um, you can also visit sciencecenter.org to, to learn more about the museum and learn more about field trips and group visits and programs, um, as well as some of our summer library reading programming. Um, so I'll just ask quickly, um, if any of you here on the on the workshop today have seen a solar eclipse, if you have, you can go ahead and maybe add some um, notes into the chat. Let us know if you've seen a partial eclipse um, or if you've actually had the privilege to be in, in the path of totality and, and seen a solar eclipse. Um, it's, at, you know, as, as other presenters have said, it's a pretty... Um, special occurrence and they don't happen very often um, in the exact place that you live. So often, often you'll have to travel. Oh, Jessica, that's so cool. Um, wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so we, um, you know, we are, again, also not quite in the path of totality at the Science Center. Um, the message we're really trying to get across is that everyone can participate in a solar eclipse. There they're not just beautiful, they are beautiful, um, but they're also an incredible opportunity for science. Um, so experiencing a total eclipse is one way that everyone can participate in real ongoing NASA science. Um, and you don't need a telescope. If you are trained and, <laughs> and ready, um, go for it, but you don't need a, a telescope to enjoy a solar eclipse. Um, you can observe the sun kind of taking safety obviously into account with your eyes, you can listen for changing sounds um, in the middle of the day. There's gonna be this moment of twilight and dusk and um, birds are gonna get quiet. So even with some cloud cover, there's gonna be changes. Um, you can measure the change in temperature. So, so the eclipse is really just a, an incredibly accessible and multi-sensory kind of uh, event. Um, and of course, NASA is interested in this, not just for the public outreach, 
um, but also for the incredible opportunity there is for, um, for science. Um, and I can share a little bit more about that in a moment. The, the highlights I just want to share out um, is, you know, around, around Ithaca, around us, um, we will be doing a weekend of, of really eclipse focused programming um, leading up to the eclipse. And many of our programs are um, really ideal for, for children and families to do together. Um, so get the word out, send, send uh, patrons, members, um, if they're interested in sort of joining a, a sort of weekend long celebration of the eclipse. We are closed that Monday and I didn't have it in me to ask our education team to stay just off the path of totality. So instead we're all going uh, north and we're gonna join up with Fairhaven um, Beach State Park and, and celebrate the eclipse in the path of totality up there. So again, for those of you up that way, if you if you wanna send people, please, please do come and join us. Um, and then we've really been able to focus on sort of preparing for the eclipse. So working closely with Tompkins County Public Library, with, with Heidi, thank you, I saw you here, um, we, with the Finger Lakes Library System, um, we're looking to really enhance the eclipse experience for um, the public across the region. Um, and I can share a little bit more about that. And then at the museum, we have some free eclipse glasses. They're also available with a small donation. Um, so if you if you know of people who are in need of eclipse glasses, send them our way. The I'm just gonna skip over a couple slides here. Um, in the interest of time, I do want to highlight um, these eclipse kits. So one of my 2024 notes to myself is to get more partners like Heidi um, Erickson from from Finger Lakes. Uh, library system. Um, this project came together very quickly and very easily, thanks to good partnerships. Uh, but we have 33 copies of these Eclipse kits that have gone out to the, the regional libraries. I will say they're pretty easy to put together, and I'm happy to make the written materials available to any of you if you're interested in putting your own kits together. Um, they're really meant for family engagement. So it's a story, Moon, moon Bear's Shadow, um, uh, an investigation looking at light and shadows, which is so important to understanding how an eclipse can happen, um, modeling some eclipse activities, and then really connecting um, the eclipse to things that we can experience here on Earth, shadows, um, eclipses that happen in our, in our solar system, um, as well as our ability to use shadows to look for um, planets both in our solar system, Dennis was, um, I think it was Dennis, maybe it was Drew, talking about um, the, the transit of Venus across the sun. We, we look for other planets across um, stars and, uh, and we look for moons as they transit across um, planets. So there's this really wonderful kind of connection to the science that we're experiencing when we experience a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse here on earth um, and the study of, of motion in our solar system. Um, I'll also just throw out the Science Center was a, a partner um, on a couple of different apps that were developed. So the DIY series, there's one about the sun. So DIY sun science and DIY solar science have really wonderful kind of take home activities that you can invite patrons to do with their families. Um, and, and con continue this sort of exploration as we're also excited about STEM and, and the solar system and NASA and, and astronomy more generally. Um, so those are some good resources. Um, and I, I have a few slides here. We've heard a lot from all of us. <laughs> Clearly this is a message NASA cares about, um, about sort of safe viewing of the eclipse. And it's because it's, it's a, a serious issue, right? We don't want anyone um, to, to be in danger as they're excited about looking at the eclipse. So one way is safety glasses. Um, there are a lot of them in our region um, and, and finding some um, is relatively easy at this point. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out um, probably to any of us. I will say the nice thing about safety glasses is people can share them. Um, so here's just a, a little more information. You don't need one pair for every person. You can um, you can share them in a family 
um, and just make sure whoever is looking up is, is wearing them. Um, one of the messages we're really trying to get across is that if you are in the path of totality, you will have a couple minutes where you can take your glasses off. And we want you to do that. We want you to um, experience totality fully. If you are off the path of totality, you won't have that um, that time. And so that's one of the messages we think is going to be a little bit confusing, especially in our region, as some people are getting messages from the path and some people are not. So if you're off the path of totality, there won't be a time where you want to experience the eclipse without glasses. But there are lots of other fun ways um, to play with shadows and to to check out the eclipse. So you can play with um, pinhole projection. You can use household items like a colander to make holes and see that shadow move um, across. You'll get those nice little crescents, um, crescent shadows. Leaves make, make pinholes. Um, so if, if leaves are out in April um, and you can catch shadows moving, moving across, you can um, get some really fun pinhole projection through the holes. Um, in the leaf shadows. Um, there are a ton of activities out there around making pinhole viewers um, yourself, and, and that can be a nice kind of take home and mem memory um, of being part of the eclipse. Um, just really quickly, and I'm happy to share these slides um, so you guys can post them too. There's so many great resources out there right now around um, engaging in the eclipse. So um, a number of people have talked about streaming the eclipse. You can do that from home. You can do that from your own library. Um, and, and the Exploratorium is a, is a wonderful resource for doing that. Um, there's also all these great ways to sort of engage in community science projects. Um, the Eclipse Soundscapes project is a way to use your phone to capture um, or only or observe yourself um, the changes in sound that I mentioned earlier um, as the eclipse happens. Um, and then the Globe Observer is a NASA app. Um, and every time there's an eclipse sort of the month before, so sometime in March, they'll open up the Eclipse um, Observer app, and that's a way to share your observations um, of the Eclipse. So it's a wonderful way for people to really participate in, in current science that's happening and share their observations back with NASA. Um, and, and I think the other thing we just want to really emphasize and, and get, um, you know, get the message out is that all this excitement about science doesn't have to end on April 8th. So we'll all still be here on April 9th and we want to keep working with you, um, working with your, your communities to share um, and, and do more STEM programming, whether it's summer reading programs um, or other outreach programming. Um, this is just a great opportunity for, for especially our region to get excited about astronomy and STEM um, and solar science. And we have lots of, of ways to keep that going. I'll also just put an, an invitation out to you all as, as librarians um, to think about documenting and archiving um, observations of the eclipse and kind of hanging on to those and keeping those um, as, a, as a resource and an archive for your communities. All right, I'll end there um, and just go through. Quick, quick thank you slides, but I'm happy to answer questions and stay on or shoot me an email. Yeah, we can leave time for some more questions. Um, in the meantime, there's a few links in the chat as well. So Mary Carol put in a link to a live guide that was compiled by Claire Lovell, and we're going to be adding to that. So you just gave us a lot of great resources that we can add in there. Um, there's also a link to a quick survey about this webinar and an invitation to our next program, which is Safe Solar Eclipse Viewing and Photography. So the link is in there, and that is on Thursday, February 22nd at noon. Um, so it's any still other... Harrington. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there was one other question that we got in advance, so I can pose this to all of our panelists today. So the question was, how can this eclipse event teach further concepts about Earth's relationship with the sun and our environment, so. Well, it depends on how much time you have, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's a, I mean, um, from my standpoint, it's it's helping people understand, uh, you know, how does this universe work? I mean, one of the questions we, you start asking, well, you know, 
you know, the, the moon is constantly going around the earth. Why don't we have an eclipse every, you know, every month? And so you get to learn, okay, well, actually, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the moon's orbit is actually sort of like 5% or 5 degree tipped with respect to its angle. Uh, uh, with this, you know, the uh, angle of the rotation with respect to our, our, our view of the sun. So it just doesn't happen very often, and nor does it happen always in the same place. Although apparently in Texas, that that, that rule doesn't apply. Because I mean, they got really lucky. They had the uh, uh, annular, well, they had a annular eclipse uh, back in October of um, of last year, and uh, and that they'll have total one uh, this year. So it's um, a lot of it also just depends on sort of, you know at what level you're you're trying to you're talking to you know like second, third, and fourth graders, or are we talking to adults? So, um, I mean, there's, you can really drill down um, pretty deep uh, in, in, in this topic. But I think ultimately it's um, an opportunity to just get people to, you know, get off their phones and, uh, and actually I engage in what's, what's happening, you know, in nature. Uh, uh, I forget, somebody was saying something about, uh, you know, just reminded me that, you know, science is everywhere, you know, and, uh, no matter where you look, uh, the science is there, and and so it's just another opportunity to, to open people's eyes as to, you know, what, um, you know, what, you know, you know, how how does science affect us uh, in our everyday life? And so, I mean, that's anybody else want to chime in there? No, Drew, I think you're totally right. We could probably spend another hour talking <laughs> about this. Um, I one of the messages we love to to kind of talk about with the eclipse um is you know just the fact that the the moon is just the right distance for an eclipse to happen is this sort of amazing celestial coincidence and so it's it's a nice opportunity to begin conversations about size and scale um the sun's diameter is about 400 times wider than than the moon um but it's 400 times further away and so we get this we get an eclipse because um because of sort of this really cool size and scale difference in our in our own planetary system um and then you can begin to talk about you know what would an eclipse look like from mars well you wouldn't see one <laughs> so you can begin to play with sort of how our our solar system and the geometry of our solar system um, are constantly at play. Um, I don't, that's just one of the, the hooks that we come back to over and over, especially for kids and, and families. That's really neat. I didn't know that. Um, Jessica, um, for anybody viewing this afterwards, um, thanks so much to all of the panelists. And uh, Sky and Telescope have put together, so even if you're viewing this from like Wisconsin or someplace, Sky and Telescope has a list of observatories and astronomical societies and clubs um, throughout, I'm thinking North America, certainly um, the US. And we also include that in the light guide that Claire put together. And I'm thinking we should probably expand that to include um, places like the Science Center in Ithaca, which does such strong work. Yeah, hopefully the recording will help uh, build some more partnerships between your organizations and with our member libraries. So thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. And we'll be sending out a link to this recording uh, when it's up and ready.